Good evening and welcome. This episode is brought to you in part by Silly Linguistics. Victorian Periodical Parade. Hey, well, Owen, how are, you, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I am so tired. It was my teaching day. And I didn't even teach as much as I normally do because my first class, they had a test. I'm just so tired. Yeah. But I am teaching my favorite class right now called the history of the novel. Yeah. And I love I love teaching. Maybe this just shows what a nerd I am. But the idea that there used to not be novels, that that got invented one day, something that's Whoa. so normal to us, it just... I find it a delicious thought to chew on and it Mm. never gets old to me. When was that? In English in the 1720s. 1720s. Okay. Yeah. So as with so many things, every other place in the world was superior and like uh, Don Quixote in Spanish. Right. That's like 1600s and France was was writing novels before England, but in England, the 1720s. Now, of course, you know, professors and scholars that are specialists in the development of the novel, they fight about which one was really the first one. But 1720s is the general. <laughs> oh, OK, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any knowledge about uh, the Chinese uh, no. novel industry i wonder gosh no now i wonder yeah because they you know they were writing poems and everything and uh we don't really have much papyrus from ancient egypt but i wonder if they were writing stories let me see if i can pull up anything oh. the chinese novel is generally considered to have first appeared in the mid to late 14th century mm, there you go 14th century um okay. yeah in general like uh, there's no, there's definitely no sense in which the English novel was, you know, earlier than other languages. So it wasn't the total invention of the novel, but for the British people that I study, it was. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Unless they could have read French, which would have been, you know, probably a select few yeah, of the, the literate people. Yeah. But so. I took it for granted, right? Novels. They've always been around. I I mean, I don't think that you're the best comparison. I always am like, is it just that I'm so nerdy that I get so excited about this idea? But (laughs) of course you are too. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like I want, like, I just, like, I cannot communicate to my students enough how wild it is to me that like, think about it. There was a time where there weren't novels and I'm sure they're always sitting there being like, Dr. Nixon, (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we got it. We got it the first of the hundred times you said that this occurred. We're not that excited about it. Yeah, it's like, but give me the excitement back. I'm throwing it to you. You Uh, give it back to me. Um, I just think it must have been like when smartphones were invented or cell phones or Facebook, like any other like, total yep. platform development yep. the way it must have shifted all of society i just find it like i get goosebumps and i've taught this class like three times before i still get goosebumps good good that's a good sign okay and welcome to victorian periodical parade the podcast that introduces you to victorian literature and victorians who read it not however, in corpse or ghost form. And we'll be talking a little bit more about ghost stories today. Um, We're a little bit, we're in the wrong season, but I think it might surprise some of our listeners to find out what season is wrong, why it's wrong. (laughs) What are we reading, Owen? So we're going to be reading The Terrible Christmas Eve by Lucy Hardy. Now, Lucy Hardy, we can find tons of evidence of. You can look her up. She wrote tons of stories Um, The rest of what I can find about her, I know only through this author and this book that you have uncovered. So why don't you tell us a bit about that since we're breaking into, we're kind of covering her stories this season. Yeah, I think so. So I was just traveling around on Twitter and watching all the Victorian um, people and article and posts fly around. And I saw the editor of this book. Uh, Johnny Maines posting about his books and and he was liking our stuff and we just got into a rapport and he posted about having a Victorian era book and he found what he calls um, the lost stories of Catherine Lord 
and she was published under the pseudonym Lucy Hardy. And at one point, he found a little note that had both Catherine Lord on it and uh, L. Hardy. I think it was maybe an AKA L. Hardy. And so that was like the only way that those two names were ever connected. Because, of course, even though there's evidence of Lucy Hardy, I don't think there was obvious evidence of where she lived or where she like came from it was just she's an author and she wrote a bunch of good books and then that's where he connected the the name lucy hardy to Catherine lord who lived from 1845 to 1901 and so then he just compiled most of her short stories is what it is the kind of interesting thing here is that um I don't know anything about Lucy Hardy. I'm not sure that there are, you know, too many people who would. So it's going to be kind of an interesting experiment in terms of giving context for these stories, because I can't use anything that I know about the author's life. Um, And I think it's going to be kind of fun, actually. Whenever I try to teach my students to think of themselves like archaeologists and to Mm. think about everything in newspapers as an evidence creating the life of who these Victorians would have been and what they would have been thinking about. So it's going to be kind of a challenge for me to have to do that with no other clues other than everything else I know about the Victorian era. So it's going to be kind of fun. Yeah, that should be good. And then if we somehow stumble on a gold mine, somebody else knows more about Catherine Lord, then yeah. it'd be perfect. And we'd be like, oh, look at this. All of this lines up and Now we know more. There is the introduction, which is the well-known writer Lucy Hardy, and that talks about a lot of stuff about her life. Okay, here it is. So in a note, she wrote to The Globe in a letter dated 1901 and published in The Globe four days after Queen Victoria's death, uh, definitively married Lucy's name to Miss Lords and even supplied her home address. It's actually a long note with a poem in it, and it ends, yours truly, Miss C. Lord Lucy Hardy. 54 Springfield Road, Abbey Road, Northwest. So that's a pretty good, the needle in the haystack that he was searching for. So that's, that's a like a famous, famously sought after scholar moments. Um, yes. Yeah. So in this episode, just to give you a quick overview of what we'll be doing, we'll read one of these stories that we picked. Well, Owen will read it. Then I will give you a breakdown of just some context for understanding it better, what it would have meant to the people reading it. Yeah, that's basically the main, of course, then we'll do our nonfiction section. This story that we picked, That Terrible Christmas Eve, Yep. That Terrible Christmas Eve, I couldn't find the magazine it was published in, The Courier. Um, As we've mentioned, if you listen to some of our earlier episodes, the Victorians were the people that just made the magazine and newspaper industry blossom. There were so, so, so many newspapers. Um, I have a a friend and colleague that I know that has studied and found Welsh newspapers written in Wales, like handwritten just for like the 15 people in their neighborhood. I mean, there are so many newspapers and magazines from these times. And so You know, in spite of as many academic databases as I may be a member of where they just (laughs) host old British newspapers, unless it's a pretty big one, your chances of being able to just quickly learn about, you know, The Courier is this magazine. They're pretty slim. Uh, And as I've said, you know, I am not a specialist in periodicals. Even if I were, there's too many for everyone to know. So I wasn't able to find anything really about The Courier, but I did find this story published in an Australian newspaper. So it's called The Adelaide Observer. Mm. Um, And I think it was almost concurrently published, Owen. Um, Oh, that's awesome. What date did did this come out in The Courier? Uh, December 28th, 1892. Okay, this is December 17th, 1892. Oh. So I don't know. Like, these are the things that, you know, somebody who is really able to research this a lot and probably somebody who knows more about periodicals than I do. Um, there were certain things about 
certain countries, like I believe, oh God, I, sh- I feel like I shouldn't even talk about this without being, without knowing more, but certain countries were just really notorious for not having copyright laws. And so they would just oh. swipe things from the second they saw it. Um, I was just finishing a Wilkie Collins novel. Wilkie Collins was a famous, basically thriller novelist. He was best friends with Dickens, Charles Dickens. Oh, wow. Cool. I just finished a book of his last night. And like a huge part of the end of it was just he breaks the fourth wall and talks trash about the American publishing industry (laughs) and how they just steal everybody's stuff and don't care. And so I don't know, perhaps, you know, this was perhaps the courier was not the first to publish it. Yeah. I highly doubt this Australian newspaper was. So I wonder what the Australian laws would have allowed them to do. But yeah, so it's published right around the same time. And I will read a nonfiction article. Usually I choose them kind of at random just because there's some really fun stuff in there. Sometimes I try to find things that are parallels to the fiction because sometimes they would sort of anticipate readers wondering or thinking or wanting to know more about a topic in the story. Today I have some pretty good uh, randomly chosen ones which I will read and then I'll go into the significance of it and what they're talking about. I'll basically almost kind of translate it more than anything because some of their language and the context can be a little bit over your head if you're not familiar with it. Victorian Periodical Parade Our Lady of Hate The Short Stories of Catherine Lord Edited by Johnny Maines And read aloud by Owen Curtis That Terrible Christmas Eve Published in The Courier December 28, 1892 Tell you a story, my dears Why you know all mine by heart already Thus spoke our old nurse, or rather, our mother's old nurse, for she had long been set aside from active work, and lived in a snug little room in one of the towers of our rambling old country house, like the old fairy in Sleeping Beauty. There she did mysterious pieces of needlework and mending, and here came all the cross and the delicate and the dull children of the house to a city of refuge. Nurse Preston had cures for every childish malady and trouble, and it was our highest delight to listen to her stories and turn over her treasures as she called a store of odds and ends, useful and ornamental, which she had accumulated around her. Therefore, on this special day, when the rain kept us all indoors and amusements flagged, we, myself and two sisters, naturally set off for Nurse Preston's chamber. Tell you a story, my dears, why you know all mine by heart already. I don't know what to say, proceeded the kind old soul, laying down her work with a puzzled expression, for a wet Christmas following an attack of the measles had made us very frequent visitors to Nurse Preston of late, and her stock of stories had been nearly exhausted. Tell us something about yourself, Nursey said little Mabel, climbing on her knee. How did you first come to know Mamma? You've told us so much about her, but you never told us how you first knew her. Oh, said Nurse Preston, stroking the child's golden hair. As I come to think of it, my knowing your dear Mamma, or leastwise her parents, for she, sweet lamb, was not born then, grew out of one of the most terrible frights I ever had in my life. "'Tell us, tell us!' we cried in chorus, for the history of a terrible fright sounded most inviting, and after coughing and settling herself comfortably in her chair, Nurse began her tale. And after coughing and settling herself comfortably in her chair, Nurse began her tale. "'Oh, well, young ladies, you must know that I was born a long way from here, right away in Devonshire. Father was bailiff to Sir George Hardy, your grandfather, and he—father, I mean— and I and my grandmother all lived in a snug cottage together. I had lost my mother, as you have, my dears, but at the time I am talking of, I was a tall lass of twenty or so, and quite able to keep father's house. We were fairly well to do. People worked harder and spent less in those days, I think. And ours was very happy home. Father had been bailiff for a great number of years. 
longer than Sir George had been master at the hall, and was greatly trusted and looked up to. It was the day before Christmas, and as I was at work in our neat kitchen preparing for the Christmas dinner, Father came in and took a canvas bag out of his breast pocket. "'See here, lass,' he said. "'I must find a safe place to lay this away, for tis more money than I care to ride across the moor with to-night.' "'Money of yours, father?' I exclaimed in surprise. "'Nay, nay. Where should I get a bag of gold from? "'Tis money of Sir George's that I am to lay out for him at the New Year Fair. "'A pretty penny there is in that bag. "'I was loath to take it, but Sir George is mad to buy a horse that is said to be worth. "'I don't know what, and thinks I shall make a better bargain for it than he will. "'So as I was at the hall today, he gave me the money before he left for London.' and I am to bid the ready penny for the beast. But I don't care to ride with a bag of gold to-night, so find a place to put it away, my girl. Poor Sir George, your grandfather, was always so careless of his money, my dears, although in this case it was safe enough in father's hands. I looked at the bag with curiosity, a little mixed with awe. I had never seen so much money in my life before. Then I glanced about for a safe place to put the treasure. We had nothing valuable to take care of, and therefore had no places of special security. "'This will do,' said Father, opening Mother's empty work-box, which was kept as a sacred relic on the dresser. "'You can put the box in the oak chest yonder with your Sunday's finery. After all, the money's safe enough anywhere in this house, for nobody knows I have it. Only I'm bound to ride over to Taunton tonight, and don't care to be well worth robbing.' "'Must you go, Father?' I asked, looking rather anxiously at the chest, where the work-box and its precious contents had just been deposited. "'Of course I must, foolish lass. Doesn't your sister expect me certain sure? And if I fail, won't she be scared fit to kill herself?' My only sister had married about a year before, and was living in Taunton. She had been ailing of late, and father had promised to spend Christmas Eve with her, returning home early the next day. He was to have ridden over on this afternoon, but Sir George's summons to the hall had detained him. Still, rather than disappoint Phoebe, he would start now, late as it was. There was nothing unusual in my being left thus alone with Grandmother. Father was often detained late at fairs and obliged to sleep away from home. Yet somehow the thought of being left in charge, as it were, of this money, such a large sum as it appeared to me, made me uncomfortable. "'Bless the girl,' said father, laughing as I told him of my misgivings. "'Do ye think I told all the village that I had the bag of gold? "'Nobody but our two selves and Sir George knows anything about it. "'So give me my coat, lass, and let's hear no more of these maggots.' "'As I turned to reach down his thick riding coat, I started. "'Surely there was a face, a man's face, looking in at the window. The evening was growing dark, and the light of the fire made the inside of our room distinct from outside. Anyone standing there could have seen Father throw the bag into my lap and open it to show me its golden contents. "'Father, there's a strange man looking in,' I cried, with sudden alarm. Father strode to the door and opened it suddenly. Yes, sure enough, a stranger stood on the threshold. "'What's your business with us?' asked Father, rather sharply. The man, he was a dark, undersized fellow, shabbily dressed, with a furtive look and a countenance I did not like, raised his cap as he answered submissively. Please, your honour, I'm a poor peddler and strange to these parts. I should be glad to hear of a place where I could get a night's lodging. This ain't an inn. If you keep along this road another mile, you'll come to one, the Black Boar, said Father, preparing to close the door. Another mile, repeated the peddler. "'And I be terrible footsore already. "'Your honour couldn't just let me have a place to lie down for the night air. "'Clean straw would do, or a couple of chairs in this kitchen. "'I'd pay for my lodging. "'Or, if that would give offence, the young lady there might please herself out of my pack and welcome.' "'I tell you, you can't stay here,' said Father. "'I'm obliged to ride to Taunton tonight, and I can't leave my girl alone with a stranger in the house.' I am sure Father repented those words before they were well out of his mouth. But he was a quick-speaking man, and I think he was a little put about at the idea of the strange man looking in the window, perhaps having seen the money. So without thinking, he let out what he had certainly better have kept to himself. 
There was no need to tell the man that Granny and I were to be all alone that night. It may have been only fancy, but I certainly thought I saw the man's face brighten at Father's speech, and perhaps Father thought it too, for he said rather sharply, Well, friend, you've had your answer, and you may as well be off, and good even to you. Stay a bit, said the peddler, in a hesitating voice, as if he were doubtful what to say. If you won't take me in for the night, maybe you'd let me leave my pack here. It's mortal heavy to carry another mile, and besides, I might not find safe quarters for it in a little inn. I'm a poor man, your honour, and couldn't afford to lose my pack. Twould be a real kindness to let me leave it here for the night. And I've a good stock of ribbons, and I've got as good a stock of ribbons as any peddler in the country, and the young lady shall have a choice in payment. My daughter is no young lady, and we don't want to be paid for doing a small civility, said father. He was a kindly man, and hated to seem churlish. For that matter, I'm sorry we can't take you in. However, we can manage your pack. If so be that you like trusting it in the hands of strangers, hand it along. I laid it down just under the edge while I came to knock on the door, said the man, shuffling off quickly, while father turned to me and said, I don't quite like his looks, but anyway, there can be no harm in taking care of his pack. The man must have left his pack some way off, to judge by the time he was gone to fetch it. At last he returned, half carrying, half dragging what looked like a large sack. Why, however could you carry a pack of that size? exclaimed father, as the man stepped inside and deposited his burden in the darkest corner of the kitchen. It ain't so heavy as it looks, replied the man, who was nevertheless out of breath with his exertions. But I've been looking for some things in it, and did it up untidy-like. However, I'll get it in ship-shape to-morrow. Good night, to your honour, and many thanks to you. And he went away. Do you think he saw the money? I asked anxiously. That money runs in your head, lass. No, I don't suppose he did. But anyway, it don't matter. You've good locks and bolts and stout shutters between you and him. Besides, if he was a thief, he wouldn't be trusting us with his pack. Fasten up well tonight, and don't get fancies in your head. At the time I was speaking of, my dears, over fifty years ago, yeoman's daughters like I was, left nerves and fancies to fine ladies, as we had no time for such nonsense. So I saw father off, and bolted up, well closing the strong shutters over the window, and got granny to bed. And it was only when I sat down to my knitting again that my thoughts began to dwell on the ill-looking stranger. We were thrifty people then, and I never thought of wasting candles when I could work by the firelight. So I sat knitting in the chimney corner, and the flames flickered and danced, making the middle of the room bright, but leaving the rest in darkness. I don't know how it was, but my eyes kept wandering to that large bundle lying indistinct in the corner. It was such an oddly shaped pack for a peddler to carry. What could be in it? Linen goods, perhaps. They would be heavy and look bulky like that. But how unusual to carry them in a sack, for such the outer covering certainly was. It was no concern of mine, but I felt such a strange, unaccountable curiosity about that package. At last I fairly laid down my work and went up to the dark corner to look at it closely. Yes, it was certainly a sack, tied up carefully with rope, but as I looked at it, was it only the flicker of the firelight? I fancied it moved. I stood staring with all my might and keeping as still as a mouse. And presently there was no doubt about it. Something inside stirred ever so gently, but yet unmistakably. The contents of that sack were alive. My heart beat so that I could hardly stand, but I crept noiselessly to the sack and laid my ear near it. Yes, I could distinctly hear a cautious, smothered breathing. I don't know how I managed to stifle the scream that rose to my lips, but luckily for me I did stifle it, though I turned sick with terror. There were Granny and I locked in with some desperate ruffian whose accomplice, the pretended peddler, had thus gained him admission to the house. Doubtless the man who looked in at the window had seen the bag of gold and laid the scheme to obtain possession of it. The man in the sack was only waiting till he supposed we were upstairs to get free of his covering and make off with the money. In one instant I thought of bolting myself upstairs with Granny and letting the robber do this, the next moment I remembered that this would be very unfaithful to Sir George. That fatal money was in my keeping, 
and I was bound to take charge of it. To carry it upstairs would be useless. The man would only pursue me in search of it, and the fright would kill Granny. I have heard that people say that desperation makes cowards brave. My terror put an idea into my head. Over the chimney-piece hung an old blunderbuss. It was not loaded. I felt thankful it was not, or I should have been afraid of touching it, and I believe it was quite out of repair. However, it would serve my purpose. I reached it down and began talking as if to myself, though I wonder I could get the words out. Dear me, I said, as distinctly as I could speak, so that the man could hear every word. It's a good thing father has left this loaded gun in case of anyone coming into the house. I wonder if I could fire it. I should just like to try. And I clicked the lock as if I were cocking the piece. It was a sad falsehood to say that the gun was loaded, but what could I do? I walked up to the sack, gun in hand. I'll try it here, he said. Don't believe there's anything to hurt in the pack. Anyway, I'll risk it. It is such a large mark to aim at. But the words were hardly out of my mouth before the sack nearly jumped on end, and I stifled a voiced cry. Hold hard! Do you want to commit a murder? So I was not mistaken. How I trembled. But there was no time for that, for I saw just the point of a knife gleam through the canvas, and I knew the man was trying to cut his way out. If he did that, it was all over with. I've a loaded gun here, I said, repeating the falsehood I am sorry to say. And if you move hand a foot off fire, lie down and keep still, or you're a dead man. The sack fell down again suddenly, and a rather frightened voice began to swear and protest. I'll go away quietly without hurting a hair of your heads, if I would only let him out of the sack. But this, you may believe, I was not fool enough to listen to. There was a large, deep, old-fashioned cupboard along one side of the room with a diamond-shaped hole in the upper panel. Into one end of this big closet I thrust my prisoner, sack and all, dragged him along as best I could, and threatened to shoot him if he resisted. Being tied up in the dark, he was quite in my power. I would have put him out of doors, for I could have trusted to the strength of our bolts and shutters to keep him out when he was once there, but I dreaded lest the other man might be lurking near, and might rush in as I opened the door. I locked the cupboard door, dragged all the furniture I could move against it, and then sat down and for the only time in my life, fainted away. I recovered to find myself lying on the floor, feeling very dizzy and confused, but I soon recollected myself. Well, I had the man safe under lock and key, but I still felt uneasy, supposing he managed to break out. I have often heard father say that you might tell a lie so often that you believed it yourself at last, and I really think I had talked so much about the gun being loaded that I had come to look upon it as a great protection, although it was about as good as a stick of firewood. I sat with it in my hand hour after hour watching that cupboard, and every now and then calling through the keyhole of the door that I was sitting ready to fire if the rubber tried to break out. I believe, poor wretch, he was frightened as I, for he kept quite still, although I fancy I heard all sorts of noises, movements in the cupboards, steps outside the window. All just fancy and nothing else. But it was not wonderful that I fancied anything, sitting there alone with the thief in the cupboard. Granny was asleep upstairs, and I did not want to disturb her, so I waited alone. Time passed by. It must have been about twelve or one o'clock when I actually did hear a step outside the door. I was in such a worked-up state that I screamed aloud. Then came a loud knocking at the door and a cry, in well-known and oh... How welcome a voice! Polly, Polly, tis Joe. Let me in. Is anything the matter? Joe, my dears, was a young farmer who had been very civil to me for a long time. I liked him very well, but I held him off rather, for I was not going to fall into any man's mouth like a ripe plum. But now I was too glad to hear his voice to stand on anything, and after cautiously unbarring the door a little, to make sure it was really Joe, I fairly threw it open, and, well, I do believe I ran straight into his arms. It was such a comfort to see him standing there so strong and handsome and looking fit to protect me against anything. Joe soon understood everything, and after he had quieted me a little, for now the danger was over, I was sobbing as if my heart would break. He bade me wrap up, 
and he would take me to his mother's in the village and then come back with help to secure the thief. But I could not leave Granny, and it was impossible to take her out in the cold night air, so it ended in Joe's running at the top of his speed for the constables while I sat before the cupboard door. Our cottage stood nearly a mile from the village, but Joe was back in a wonderfully short time, and then he and the constables opened the door and took out my prisoner. He had cut his way out of the sack and lay huddled up in the corner, half stupefied through want of air and looking miserable enough. Although he went away very quickly with the men, I felt indeed thankful that I had detected him in time to secure him, for a villainous-looking fellow he was with a large knife in his hand. Oh, I can see him now. But why did your friend Joe come to the house so late at night? asked Adela, who was of an inquiring turn of mind. Well, my dear, Joe was looking after me, as I said, and had happened to meet my father riding to Taunton, and father had been speaking of the strange man who had asked for a lodging, and how frightened I had seemed at it. Joe kept thinking about this all evening and somehow got restless. He did not like to think of me being troubled about anything, so he was fool enough to walk down late at night when he ought to have been abed, just to see that all was right at our house. Then he heard me scream and knocked at the door. And what became of the thief? Oh, he and his friend were both taken. They were part of a gang of burglars who had come down to rob some of the large houses about our neighborhood. As I thought, one of them had seen Father open the bag of gold as he looked in through the window, and when he could not get into the house himself he just tied up his mate in a sack, and pretended that this was a peddler's pack. A great escape we had, for these very men had murdered an old woman at one house they had robbed some months before, and warrants were out against them. What became of them at last? One was hanged, poor wretch. The other, who had saved his neck by giving evidence, the pretended peddler, was sent across the seas. I hope he repented and did better in another country. But, oh, my dears, the fuss everyone made about me afterwards. I'm sure I don't know why. Father said I had saved my granny's life and Sir George's money by my courage, and that he was proud of his daughter. And Sir George, though he was such a naughty gentleman, came down himself when he returned home after Christmas to thank me, while Joe was more foolish about me than ever. And when Joe and I were married some months later, Sir George gave our wedding dinner at the hall, and a noble one it was. Half the tenants were there. Sir George himself came down and made a speech and spoke of what he called my great courage and fidelity, and then he gave me a purse with just fifty gold guineas, half what the bag had held, begging I would accept this mark of his esteem as a wedding gift. I felt quite confused and ashamed at so much fuss being made about me, for although Joe said that most women in my place would have just made themselves safe upstairs and let the thief carry off the money, I do not think any one would have been so unfaithful of things in their care. For my part, I was always rather ashamed to think of the lies I told about the gun being loaded, but I was so terribly frightened, and thought my only chance was to make the man believe I could shoot him. But you haven't told us how you came to be Mama's nurse, said little Mabel. Ah, my dear, said Nurse, a shade falling on her kind, cheerful face. I only had my Joe for five short years. Five years I was a happy wife, and then I lost the best, the kindest husband that ever breathed. There was fever in our village, and my Joe caught it. I buried him in my little girl, our only little girl, in one week. Then I went back to live with father. But Phoebe and her husband had come to him after I married, so he didn't really need me. Then Sir George's young wife, who had been so good to me in my trouble, came and asked me if I would like to be nurse to the baby that was expected at the hall. She knew how I loved children, and that I understood a good deal about the care of them, and she thought, dear, kind lady, that it would turn my sad heart from dwelling always on my own losses if I had another little one to love. So I went to the hall after your mamma was born, and it was a real home to me and I only left it when my dear young lady married and brought me here with her. You are to live here always now, Papa says, said Adela. I hope I may, my dears. I saw your dear mamma the day she was born. I dressed her for her wedding, and I helped to lay her in her coffin. 
I love you all as if you were my own children, and I shall be sad indeed to leave you now. I am too old a woman, my dears, to expect to live to see you all grown up, but I hope, when you do, you will all be as sweet and as good and as gentle as my dear lady your mamma was. Miss Mabel has her golden hair, and Miss Adela her soft voice, and I think you, Miss Lucy, are most like her in face, but I hope you all have a sweet temper and her loving heart. My dears, good comes out of evil, but for that dreadful night's terror I might never have been Joe's wife, or known my sweet young mistress and her children. Okay, well, I found this story very fascinating. One thing I found really interesting about this is that it was super short. And the Victorians, the British Victorians, were not really masters of the short story. That was actually much more an American art form, hmm. which is kind of interesting to think about because in so many things, like, like with everything, insert my traditional caveat that I'm sure there's scholars out there that would roundly disagree with me. But <laughs> in my humble opinion, there is so much similar in 19th century America and 19th century Britain. Obviously, oh. just like Americans and British people have different sort of temperaments and stuff today that existed back then. But, you know, there was so much cross communication, especially after the development of the telegraph in the 1840s. There was so much communication that, as we were saying earlier, stories and author like novels would go back and forth so quickly. So they're reading the same things. Fashion is similar in both places. And see, there's a lot of, I don't know if I would say they're similar cultures as much as I would say there's a shared cultural discourse and shared knowledge of the same things. So for all those similarities, it's very interesting that the British just weren't invested in the short story the way Americans were. And I actually grapple with this a lot as a professor because I never have anything, I'm a British scholar, so like I have nothing ever short to give my poor students yeah. to ease them into it. And generally, if I want to give them an example of like a short story about women's rights, I'll just assign an American one just to get them really? used to some of the ideas. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. There were <laughs> so-called short stories in that these British quote unquote short stories were not 900 page novels, yeah. but they still end up being 60 page stories. Oh, so sure. You know, I think like Wilkie Collins would have been like, yeah, it's shorter than that novel I wrote. But like, <laughs> they're not short stories in the way we're accustomed to reading them by people like Shirley Jackson. And so that really struck me that she was writing this very short story. I was able to read it in 15 minutes, maybe, maybe. So that's one thing that just stood out to me. I don't have a lot to say about it, except that perhaps that is a unique feature of her as an author that I think we'll kind of be able to test that theory and see how well it holds as we read more of her stories. The second thing, I'm, I'm holding off getting to my favorite thing, <laughs> because I think we should go over the general things about her first. With a name like Lucy Hardy, as you already know, Owen, because at School Fjorden, I always am bringing up Thomas Hardy, even though he's not Norwegian. <laughs> almost defiantly constantly bringing up Thomas Hardy. <laughs> and there would have been no way by 1892, for instance, I'm assuming she wrote a great deal of her work in the 80s and 90s. She was very aware of that drawing on the cultural clout of Thomas Hardy. Mm -hmm. He was so, so famous by that point. He was knighted by the end of his life. George Bernard Shaw was one of his pallbearers. I mean, the guy was, he was honestly, he, he was born around the same time as Lucy Hardy in 1840, oh, yeah. but he lived until almost 1930. Wow. And so what happened is Thomas Hardy came to represent for people like Virginia Woolf, yeah. Yeats, the Irish poet. He, came, he was the last living Victorian celebrity, essentially. Wow. They would all go visit him. They would send him their work. I mean, he was just kind of, even if they hadn't maybe really liked him in his heyday, it was like he represented like British excellence for them at that point. It was like a nationalistic type of pride. Yeah. So 
there is no way by the late 80s and 90s when uh, Hardy wasn't necessarily like the last living Victorian anymore, but he was in his peak of celebrity. That would have been an obvious thing. She's kind of name dropping and she's kind of making everybody wonder if she's related to him. Oh, yeah. Um, It would be like writing a book right now and be like, Owen's Owen Dickens like it's just a name everybody knows or Owen right. Shakespeare and so I think that's actually really clever and interesting the, the I would have just discarded that as an unimportant piece of trivia except for the undeniability of how much it would have brought to mind Thomas Hardy except for two things one she has characters named Hardy in this story so as the story is narrated in the first person, I actually noticed it because of one of your notes oh, that cool. you had labeled that it was Hardy. And I was like, no, Owen, right. just because it's in the first person, that doesn't mean it's her, the author talking. But then I saw like, actually, no, she is writing in the first person and it's not just some first person narrator. She is making it of the supposed Hardy lineage. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's cool. Yeah, no, I wouldn't have noticed it either. Um, so again, I guess I would add to that a sub point that that's kind of unique. I I don't know that I've really seen a novelist in this time or an author in this time who uses the first person and then specifically means that to apply to their novelist name. Hmm. So that's interesting. And so with her doing that and making it appear somehow that it gives perhaps a sense of verisimilitude that somehow she is really connected to, I mean, of course people wouldn't have thought it was a pseudonym, but by giving this lineage, she's adding this sense of like real human history to her lineage, which would even more be bringing up Hardy. And Thomas Hardy was famous for writing about this one little part of England called Dorset. Okay. Yeah. Which is in the Southwest. It's about two 90 minutes southwest of London, kind of goes down near the coast. Okay. And she sets her, and I, I noticed this because I almost thought she said that her family in the story is from Dorsetshire. And I was like, oh my God, she's really, really trying <laughs> to like build off his legacy. But no, she says Devonshire, yeah. which is just a little bit farther east. Um, so and smart. It's in- Oh, it's very interesting, but it's like right there, but not there. Yeah. And so Hardy famously was writing about Dorset, where he was from, to, I always say, to kind of show the the literary elite in London that there was a value to understanding these very backwards rural cultures. I go to Dorset every couple of years, um, and it's still mostly composed of one lane roads and by one lane i mean if somebody's coming the other direction you have to back up into the hedges yeah literally one lane yep so to think you know if it's um, to to this day most of the houses there have thatched roofs that is epic it is just i don't want to call it a backwater because i love it but like Mm. It is so, so, so disconnected from everything we think of as modern society in 2021. So you can imagine when Hardy was writing in 1880, the Londoners reading Dickens and Wilkie Collins would have really turned their nose up at like, why do we care about this? Like, they would have called it a backwater. Like, why would we care about Dorset? Yeah. And so where Lucy Hardy is writing about is considered like, even to Hardy, he would sort of exoticize this area. It's almost oh. out towards Cornwall. And Cornwall oh. has its own, like, interesting dialect. And, like, they're considered very almost as different as, like, Welsh or something. Right. So she's doing some really interesting things by drawing on his legacy and literally imaginatively drawing the reader's mind's eye just a little bit farther more exotic and interesting and fascinating and maybe even a little spooky for this story right the last thing i think we should definitely go over i have five more minutes (laughs) um is that in this time period ghost stories were a christmas tradition i opened the episode by saying you know listeners may feel this is a bit out of season because 
you know, they're probably thinking it's not Halloween, but right. for the Victorians, ghost story time was Christmas time. And that oh. is why this is specifically happening on Christmas Eve. This is why, regardless of what paper we find it in, it's being published in December. Oh, gotcha. Mm -hmm. dun, dun, dun. And I actually didn't really know the roots of this tradition. I just know that it's a thing sure. in the Victorian era. It comes out of like the winter solstice traditions of just like mm -hmm. thinking that the veil between the worlds is thinner. And Right, yeah. Yeah. So the last thing I really want to say about this particular story is I meant I brought up ghost stories and there's got to be a few people out there that are like, but it's not a ghost story. It's a crime right. story. That's what I was hinting at too in my brain. Yeah. So this is what I find very interesting. She's clearly building on the Christmas ghost story tradition. There's no way yeah. around that with the title and the publication date. This is the content people would have been wanting. Mm. And all through the story, any well-read Victorian would have been waiting for the ghost. And in yes. fact, I was waiting for a ghost all story. I was like, <laughs> there's not a real guy in that bag or she's going to open the cupboard and there's not going to be anyone in there. Mm -hmm. And then no, like they were criminals and they were sent to prison and executed and the end, like they murdered a lady down the road, like good job. Thank, thank God they didn't murder me. I actually specialize most primarily in the 1890s we have very niche niches in academia yep. and this time period is called the fin de siècle it means the end of the cycle it's a very different cultural time than the mid-century in the mid-century we have a lot of optimism we've just they've just come out of the industrial revolution there's been some progressive social changes people feel pretty good about the possibilities for the British nation. Hmm. By the late century, there's this sort of general disappointment and pessimism in society. This sense that, well, the Industrial Revolution brought us some problems too, yeah. and colonialism isn't all we thought it would be, and maybe there's some real issues with that. And there's just a, a general sense in in a broader way that, sticking to what people might think of as the stereotypical Victorian norms of uprightness and family values didn't sort of reap the rewards society was still promised. There was still venereal disease oh, because yeah. people still cheated on each other. And in fact, <laughs> syphilis is a huge, huge concern late in the century, bringing up for people more than just the disease itself, but questions of like, what were these family values supposed to yeah. get me, you know? And yeah. why isn't anything working out the way we promised? Along with this, pragmatically, we've seen over the century rampant industrialization and urbanization. I personally think that this is why the detective novel comes about in the late century. Sherlock Holmes is an, uh, a figure of the very, uh, of the 1880s and 90s. And this is the way I always tell my students. In the 1840s, if a stranger comes into town, nobody's seen him before, and the next day when a neighbor Joe's sheep is missing and you see the stranger riding away on the sheep, it's pretty clear to everyone. You can know what happened. You knew that nobody in your town of 15 people knew that guy. You know that there you are down one sheep of your 20 or whatever. And the guy can't get away that fast. You know, he's like walking a sheep away. Right. The way I put it two ways. You could not have crime stories in the way they did, like the detective novel type thing, until the 1890s. You could not have it. And it was also not really demanded until then. Yeah. So two things. What you have all of a sudden is a very crowded, anonymous world. Yes. Let's say you're living in London, and in London you lose your pocket watch you're never going to know where that pocket watch went because not only do you not know anyone around you probably, but there's thousands and thousands of people around you. It could be any one of them and whoever it was could get away on the next railroad and be on the other side of the country. Yep. So the, the story of crime fiction now, of course, crime fiction way predates the Victorian era, but I mean this sort of crime novel where everything's tied up in a neat little bow and the problem is solved and the bad guys are punished. Oh. This sort of crime story 
in my worldview only comes about and is only desired by people at this late period because they're stressed out about yeah. these things. There's so much uncertainty. Even by the mid-century, you find people writing stories about body doubles and people yeah. pretending to be, because there weren't social security cards. Right. Because yeah. you didn't need them before, but all of a sudden we need them and we don't have a system. And how do we know who anybody is? Mm -hmm. It's like Victorian catfishing, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Except you could like just become a person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you see lots of fiction written in like the late 1860s about that. And by the 90s, it becomes the crime narrative, the kind of the procedural crime narrative where they're like, boom, 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 we fixed it. And so it not only was demanded to sort of help people process these anxieties and worries, but it also in general wasn't possible because you couldn't have the same sort of high speed getaways and chases and telegraphing ahead to the next city to say, catch them. <laughs> in Bleak House, we do see it. We see a horse and carriage police chase and it is so freaking boring. Oh. Like yeah. you need that urgency and that speed to make it kind of captivating. So what I found really interesting about this story is simply that she took this old, old tradition of the Victorian ghost story. Yep and updated it for the modern taste. And it was just a Victorian crime story. There was nothing otherworldly. In fact, it was, I don't know, I got kind of an icky feeling from reading it. Like it was just these home invaders. Like she had been oh, in right. actual danger. It wasn't, you know, yeah. this kind of titillating suspense of like the ghost that might be there. It was like, no, right. that guy was probably gonna murder you and your grandma. Like it was really yeah. gritty. Yeah, yeah. It was. And along those lines, because I had read similar and more of the Victorian ghost stories, I was waiting for the grandma to hear, walk down the stairs and die and, and to become a ghost right there and, mm -hmm. and like instantly haunt the house and maybe scare the guy out. But yeah, I was. Oh, yeah. The jacket says the collection of ghost stories. Well, and I have to imagine that readers were expecting the ghost so it's kind of right. fun to be like we were feeling what they were feeling like yeah. we were in their spot to be like where's the, like I was so convinced that guy in the sack was a ghost <laughs> oh really yeah you, yeah yeah you were even deeper in in the, in the Victorian reading and I was like somebody's gonna die right <laughs> yeah. or when she first spoke about the face in the window I was like there's the ghost is oh gonna... yeah for sure yeah, i was like, like they think it's an intruder window. but it's a ghost it's like yeah. some yeah yeah it's perfect completely coming up now we have kari nixon reading the newsstand where we talk about what the victorians were reading besides fiction and in this section we're going to break down what that means for listeners today and what that meant for the victorians who were reading about the news articles or the things pertaining to their daily life so, as I said, I found this Australian newspaper that had printed this story. And I just scanned around and found an interesting page. There's a section here called British and Foreign Anglo Colonial Gossip. Ooh. And I might read that because I'm increasingly invested in studying colonialism. Ooh. But I see this other one that says. 11 men froze to death in quotes. <laughs> in so Australia? Kind of, well, it's nice probably and intriguing. Not. Well, of yeah. course not, but it's intriguing to be like, this is in an Australian art uh, newspaper. They had wandered round and round in that blinding snowstorm, hopelessly lost in a place only a hundred yards square. And when cold and fatigue vanquished them at last, they scooped out a cave in the snow and lay down and died not knowing that five steps more would have brought them into the true path. Oh, ha, ha, ha. Thus, 11 precious lives were lost in making the descent from Mont Blanc in September 1870. They suffered the bitterest deaths recorded in the history of these mountains, full as that history is with dreadful tragedies. Okay, so this would have been, they're talking about something 20 years earlier, which is interesting. Yeah. Mont Blanc is... <laughs> A mountain that was made famous by the early century romantic poets 
Uh, well, I mean, they might, it might've been famous before them, but they famously, right. so the romantic poets, I'm just teaching this in my British lit class. The romantic poets are from like the 18... 15 time period okay. um so way before the victorian era and they really wanted they believed that if they could seek out amazing and awesome enough landscapes and wilderness that they could encounter sublime experiences mm. and then later like discover truths psychological truths from these experiences so mm. one very famous poem um written by Shelley is about all about Mont Blanc like and so everybody would just go see Mont Blanc like this is a thing I'm curious why this is important enough to write 20 years later let's see sad to think they were so near safety and yet through ignorance so far from it alas how many die under different conditions but for a like reason here is a man who says, all my friends thought I was doomed, and I did not care whether I lived or died. He explains as follows. Up to October 1885, he says, I was a strong, healthy man and equal to any kind of work. At this time, I was taken with a pain that seemed to shoot straight through my heart. I felt as if something was squeezing my heart, and I was in dreadful agony. I had to abandon work and lie up. Then I fell into a low, weak way. I had no appetite, and every morsel I ate gave me a great pain at the chest and a tight, uncomfortable feeling as if all my food turned to wind and did not pass my stomach. I had a great pain at my back and sides and was never free from pain night or day. Such food as I was able to take lay like a load on my stomach, and my heart would thump so badly I could get no sleep, and night after night I would lie awake. That week I dare not lift the lightest article, and so nervous that the slightest sound startled me. Even the children's noise as at play upset me. When I ventured out of doors, I had to often stand and rest, and my legs were so unsteady I could not walk straight. All this told on my spirits. Before my attack, I scarcely knew my strength. I could lift a sack of flour with ease. I went to our doctor who said mine was a bad case. He gave me medicines, but I got no relief from them. Now better, now worse, but never well. I remained in this state for over 12 months and was under the doctor all that time. At last, the doctor recommended me to go to Norwich Hospital and put myself under a celebrated physician there as an indoor patient. I did so in November 1886. The physician said, your heart is strained and very weak. Whilst in the hospital, I was examined by three doctors, and after being under treatment five weeks, my case was pronounced incurable. The doctor said I would never be able to do hard work again and would never get any stronger. I was now anxious to get home. So I left the hospital but kept on receiving medicine as an outdoor patient for three months longer. Getting weaker and weaker, I gave up taking their medicine and tried different medicines my friends told me of, but nothing did any good and I lingered on month after month. Now indeed I began to despair, for from a strong, powerful man I was reduced almost to a shadow and did not care whether I lived or died. In June 1887, a book was left at my house which described a preparation called Mother Siegel Syrup, and I read of one case like mine being cured by it. I said to my wife, here is a case that exactly corresponds with my case. I had lost all faith in medicines, but as a last resort sent to Mr. Edgeley Supply Store's Bungay for a bottle and had not taken more than half the contents before I felt better. Wife, I said, I believe this Siegel Syrup is going to cure me. I began to eat, and food did me good, and I grew stronger and stronger. After taking three bottles, I got back to my work strong and healthy, and since then, I have never looked behind me. By taking an occasional dose, I keep in good health. I can now eat anything and do any kind of work, and went through harvesting as well as anyone, and can lift a pig with ease. I thank God that Siegel syrup was ever made known to me and feel that I owe my life to it. You are at liberty to publish this statement as I am willing to tell any one of the benefit I have derived from the medicine. Yours truly, Mr. Robert Wright, Urum Bungay, Norfolk, signed by a witness, Isaac Wright. Mr. Wright's, it continues, Mr. Wright's complaint was indigestion and dyspepsia, and the heart disturbance which so alarmed him was the result of the mechanical pressure of the stomach against the heart when the latter was inflated with the gases created by undigested and fermenting food. 
Many are misled thus to mistake indigestion for some other malady. We can only say we are glad our friend found the true path, the right medicine, before his disease left him no remnant of life to blow into the flame. <laughs> so is that connected to the snow story? Yeah. <laughs> so it seems like the snow story... Like, they basically were, like, they were so close to getting out, but they weren't. Like, they were so close right. to the answer, but they died. And I guess yeah. it's a stretchy, like, a stretch it's of a metaphor. It's kind of a stretch. And does it, does it sound like it's also an advertisement? Yeah. It did. Yeah. I, I got halfway through it, and I was like, oh, this is a, a weird ad. Yeah. But then I was, like, I saw, like, commentary on his statement, and I was like, well, maybe it's not. I'm trying to see if it goes on to the next page just in case but no yeah, yeah no that's just an ad like clear yeah. i mean maybe some guy actually wrote that but then the company right. clearly published it yeah. um what i can say about that though because this is another thing that kind of gave us uh, a trick like a yeah. sleight of hand like the ghost yep. story so it's kind of cool thematically this sort of narrative of being like victorian invalidity is so 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 common yeah and that's why it was able to even like fool me into right. being like oh this is just some guy's story of his illness and his journey through that because i mean it's so common i just did an annotated bibliography about scholarly analyses of victorian contagion and a huge part of what i was finding was more just studies of this idea of the, the victorian state of chronic illness what it meant for them, how we would perceive it today. And so this is just such a common genre that they've really cleverly, I think, yeah. I think it would have also roped other readers in because you're right. like, oh, you're talking about like kind of romantic poetry. That's kind of yeah. highbrow. And, oh, this is like one man's journey through illness. Like sometimes I've had weird problems that I struggle mm -hmm. with. And then you get to the end and you're like, oh my Seagulls. God, it was an ad. Yeah. It's like, oh my gosh, it's such an obvious ad. But then it's such a good story. Like, I know. A lot of good emotion and a lot of good details. But there is a weird disconnect between the Mount Blanc and this. Like, that was super weird. Yeah. It's a big transition, too big. It's kind of like, I don't know. I feel like I've seen like, ads on the internet that are just as tricky as that <laughs> yes. where you're like oh. you think you're watching a real thing and or a commercial somebody yeah no i've seen commercials YouTube that video. are yeah i've yeah. seen i can't think of one off the top of my head but i've seen ones that kind of trick you and you don't yeah. realize it's an ad and then at the end you just feel so bad because you're like oh i've watched that so intently and now it's just an ad. yes yeah that's what that was yeah. i know i had all these thoughts to be about like these are like very human experiences and like i've been mm -hmm. struggling with these health things and i think mm -hmm. everybody's gone through this and now i don't want to because i just feel so right. tricked. i wonder how the victorians would feel at the end it kind of seems like they would be like, oh, if I ever have this problem, I'm going to go mm. look for seagulls. Do you think they would take it positively? No, I would be tempted to feel like they'd be tricked like us. Like, OK, All but right. maybe I'm just assuming they'd feel like me. No, Victorian advertising culture was so fascinating. Um, oh, cool. But sometimes I'll just look through the ads just to like see how they talk about it. It's very, yeah. very interesting and maybe something we can cover as the nonfiction section someday. So uh, that was pretty cool. I learned a lot. Did you hear about that that like shipwreck off the San Juan Islands recently? No. Really? No, I, I, I think I missed that one. There were like, all these people died. And um, anyway, I've been having some really bad heartburn. And... I have just been like really beside myself trying to figure out answers and figure out what's wrong with me. Anyway, take Prilosec. What? I was trying to mimic what he did. Yeah. No, I was, yeah. I, I, <laughs> but it was, you did a very short version and I was like, oh, it's an advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> Victorian Periodical Parade. Welcome to the ad break on Victorian Periodical Parade. Here we're going to be discussing anger. Have you heard about anger? That is what we are using to host our podcast. It is the easiest way to make a podcast. 
It is free at the base level. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast from your phone or your computer. Another beautiful and easy feature is that Anchor will distribute your podcast for you in such a way that it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and any other podcatcher that you are currently using. You can get paid for turning your hobby into a podcast. And there is no minimum listenership. Everything required to make a podcast is located on one simple website. And now, dear listeners, if you are interested in creating a podcast, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. You can further support us by clicking on the link in the feed below. Thank you and enjoy listening to the Victorian Periodical Parade on Anchor Podcasts. Good day. Victorian Periodical Parade Victorian Periodical Parade